Goldstein. I'm the concertmaster of the New Bedford Symphony Orchestra. And that was the preludio to the third partita by Bach for solo violin. And um, if you're tuning in a second time, this was supposed to be a companion piece to a prior performance that got some unfortunate things happened and a lot of people didn't get to see it. So I'm hoping uh, you're able to hear it now. Um, I wanted to first start off by giving a huge thank you to uh, Bob Feingold. Uh, Robert J. Feingold and Associates are, have been sponsoring some of these online concerts. And um, Bob and Jan, uh, they're very good friends. And I just, you know, the symphony really matters to them. And I want to encourage everybody to please support Robert J. Feingold and Associates for all your uh, real estate law needs. The next time my wife and I need one, we're certainly going to need Bob. And I think it, it matters to support uh, people and organizations that support the symphony because they, they care about something else just besides uh, the, their work. They're trying to contribute to the culture. Um, so, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about going under the hood of this uh, Bach partita. Uh, as you see behind me, uh, I have a bit of a vice, and that is books on music. I have a collection of it. I just enjoy reading about composers and music. Um, there were real people with real problems and real joys. And I always glean a lot of information by studying about the piece and the composer before I play something. So I thought maybe we could go under the hood together uh, and dive a little bit below the surface. And I think a nice way to frame it is with the five W's, the who, what, when, where, and why. And the what, obviously, is this is uh, one of a group of six pieces for solo violin um, that Bach wrote in 1720. Uh, we know it's 1720 because in the manuscript copy that survives, there is in, uh, a date, 1720, in the lower right-hand corner of the music. Now, that places Bach in the town of Curtin, Anhalt Curtin, where he was employed from 1717 to 1723. And uh, Bach was quite good friends with the prince in Curtin, a prince named Leopold, and allowed Bach to write much of his great secular pieces of music, uh, the cello suites, the, the, the sonatas and partitas, the violin concertos, lots of the keyboard suites, the uh, First book of the Well-Tempered Clavier, which he sketched in prison in his head in 1717. Yes, Bach is an ex-con. And the Brandenburg Concertos, among many others. Um, and another just frame for this discussion, and I wish we could be talking together, and I want to encourage you, if you have any questions, to type them in to the uh, chat. And if for some reason it gets blocked, um, please, you can email me at jholstein at communitymusicworks.org, or you can just send the symphony some questions, and I will be happy, more than happy, to answer them. Another uh, thing I'd like to scaffold this discussion with is going from the court to the country with these dances. And Bach was well-versed in both worlds. He grew up not in particular money, he was an orphan by the age of 10, uh, but he relied on the employment of the aristocracy. So he knew the dances in the court, he knew the dances in the courtyard, and he knew the dances out into the country. So we're gonna travel from dance to dance. The first dance is a lure, a very high courtly French dance uh, from the Baroque period. And uh, what's interesting about the lure is that it has a, what the musicologists call an anacrusis, or a pickup. And it is a dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-bum-bum-bum. And 
I was able to play for two of my former teachers. In fact, they're still my teachers. Uh, James Buswell, great American violinist, and Marilyn McDonald, one of the great Baroque violinists, who I studied with at Oberlin, and she said, you know, there was actually a leap by the dancers over the bar line. Yum, bum, 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 bim, bi, dum. And so this changed the way I played it. it uh, also with Mr. Buswell's teaching, they both encouraged me to go slightly faster, more of the dance quality to this, and it didn't need to be quite so heavy. So I will play that for you now. scaffolding the why. Why did he write these pieces? Uh, we know there was no later than 1720. It could have been earlier, um, but most scholars agree that in this curtain period from 1717 to 1720 is when he wrote these pieces. Uh, it could have been a challenge for himself. If you notice in this last movement, there was a lot of what we call polyphony or two notes, two lines going at the same time. Uh, 
Up to this point, the violin was primarily a monophonic instrument, meaning a single line. So when you hear the orchestra play, say in a Vivaldi concerto, it's usually just one line. Well, Bach took this medium and created these incredibly rich polyphonic pieces. Perhaps it was a compositional challenge. Perhaps it was a job application. The Brandenburg concertos were a job application. He didn't get the job. Uh, but perhaps he was sending these manuscripts out to different courts. Uh, perhaps it was written for the concertmaster of Curtin. We don't know. Uh, and the other scaffold, we'll have two ladders here, is this dance now, we're out of the court slightly. We are maybe in the hallway outside of the court for a slightly more rustic dance, the gavotte and rondo. And the gavotte also has an anacrusis, yum, bum, e, yum, bum, 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 e, yum, bum, e. And uh, so it is a little bit more rustic, possibly a little bit more off strain uh, than the lure. The other thing, the rondo, is not anything to do with dance, but a structural device, meaning round. It keeps coming back to that melody, the yum, bum, e, yum, bum, 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 bum. And in between the rounds, the round, the rondo, there are these four dramatic episodes, each with its own profile, and it's fun to play them very differently from one another.
The next two dances are pair, and they are the two minuets. We are going to move from the hallway back into the court. And these are two, again, French courtly dances. The minuet being made, the grandfather of the waltz of one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, my teacher, James Buzzle, was really encouraged me to bring out the courtly quality by playing more off the string. And then my other mentor and teacher, Marilyn McDonald, pointed out, well, you know, in the minuet, the foot only came down one every, once every two bars. So that really changed the way I thought of it. Before, I used to play it But now, it allows for a longer line and dovetails really beautifully with James Boswell's courtly idea. So I'll play them for you know. Oh, I should say, sorry, the second minuet is a contrast to the first minuet. It changes the timbre and texture of it. And um, what became of the second minuet in the classical period, it became the minuet in trio literally played by three instruments, then it was expanded for the whole orchestra or string quartet, whatever have you, and, this, and the trio became the scherzo with Haydn and Beethoven. But for now, it's just two minuets, but each has its own character.
final two dances are out of the court, out of the courtyard, and into the country for the two rustic dances of this partida. Oh, I should have said in the sonatas and partidas, what makes the difference between the sonata and the partidas, they both, partida just means in parts, but there is a dance connection to the partidas that the sonata does not have. Just wanted to point that out. So the last two dances are a bourree and a jeek, and I will play them back to back without stopping. Um, and the bourree, uh, uh, Mr. Buswell asked me, well, do you know what another other name for a bourree is? And I didn't know. He said, it's a hornpipe. And he encouraged me to play it in a much less courtly way. So there are these two pickups that those are like horns, bomb, bomb, these honks. And you'll hear the honks throughout the movement. The jig, or the jig, now the first time I learned this a long time ago, it was just a challenge to learn the notes and the rhythms and the bowings and try to remember it all. And um, I paid no attention to the time signature. I thought it was in 3-8. So there would be a step on every beat, but that's not the case. It is in 6-8, which really lightens it up. There maybe would be a step or a heavy foot on the downbeat, but then the rest of the bar is not quite as heavy and perhaps more horizontal. So that also changed the way that I played it. So I will play the, the um, so hornpipe, the bourre, and the jig.
understand that unfortunately some of our viewers were not able to continue uh, past the first movement. That's unfortunate. So I guess we can't have questions. Uh, but um, I wanted to uh, just say that uh, this has been an, uh, a really great project for me to revisit an old musical friend. You know, I've reconnected with a lot of friends uh, from college and other uh, music festivals um, over Zoom and Skype and FaceTime. And I've been able to reconnect with this musical friend and uh, look at it again with fresh eyes with the help of um, my wonderful teacher. I am taking lessons again, uh, James Buzzell, and I was also very fortunate to spend some time playing it through for Marilyn McDonald um, out in Cobalt, Ohio. And this is not my final say on this. I'm going to probably put this on the back burner. I'm going to be working on another Bach unaccompanied work over the summer and um, a lot of unaccompanied work and some duos with my wife, Aline. Um, and I wanted to really thank you for tuning in. Um, again, I wanted to huge thank to uh, Bob Feingold uh, and Associates um, for sponsoring these concerts. And again, please support the businesses and people that are supporting the symphony right now. It's really important. Um, I want to also thank the staff at the New Bedford Symphony office. It's a small staff, but it is a mighty staff and they do amazing things and I think it really speaks to the care of the organization showing, uh, for the care they're showing for the musicians by offering these concerts uh, and uh, supplementing the musician's income that has really been um, taken a hit with this virus. And it really speaks to just the character of the symphony and I'm proud to represent it. Um, I also wanted to, to encourage you to tune in this Sunday for the next concert it is with three uh, very dear friends of mine um, playing music that I love dearly. Um, Emmy Holmes Hicks, who is the principal second of the orchestra, with her two housemates, um, Andre Bauman, piano, and on, uh, Adrian Taylor, cello, will be playing a program of Dvorak, the uh, four romantic pieces for violin and piano the uh, Silent Woods for cello and piano, and then the Dunky Trio for all three of them, so the pianist will be busy. Um, so that's at 4 p.m. this Sunday, and I really encourage you to tune in. And please, if you're uh, listening out there and wanted to ask a question, please send it to the symphony. And I'm terribly sorry for some of you, you're probably not even hearing this, that it got uh, shut down. Um, maybe we'll have to do a Zoom call where they can't get in. But again, thank you and have a great night.